You know, a, a very dear friend of mine was Isabel French. She was for many years the archivist and the editor of the Louisiana Historical Society. And she always said that she hated speaking over a microphone because it sounded as though she was speaking from the other side of the grave. And I have the same feeling right now. <laughs> so it, it's a great pleasure to be with all of you today. Such a great auspicious time to have so many Villeray gathered in one room. There are those who will say it was wonderful, and it is wonderful, but then there are those who say that, you know, perhaps there could be some element of concern as well. But it's, it's great to have you here. And now we are going to begin with this wonderful genealogical chart, which I hope you can see, which was done by Alcé Villeray. Alcé Villeray was for many years clerk of the Civil District Court in Orleans Parish, and perhaps the first Villeray to chronicle the family's genealogy and history. He married Odile Fletas, you can see her portrait in the hall here, and was a son of Anatole Villeray and uh, Elmina Fostal. The chart begins with Joseph Roy de Villeray and his wife Louise de la Chaise, and lists the eight children born to the marriage of their son, Jacques-Philippe Villeray and Henriette Fazande. And the children are René Gabriel, whose descendants are here, Delphin, Jules, Caliste, Félix, Anatole, Adèle, and Leocadie. These children and their offspring married into other families belonging to the ancien population, the ancient population, the colonial elite of Creole Louisiana. Joseph Roy de Villeray married Louise de la Chaise in 1759. He was the son of Etienne Roy, occasionally Le Roy or Le Roy, and Catherine Neveu. She was a native of Montreal. The 1724 census of farmers along the Mississippi River, from New Orleans to the Washa, or German village, records entry number six, quote, Etienne Roy, age 33, native of Montréal, his wife living on Bienville's land. So we know definitely that the progenitor of the Villeray family was a part of building New Orleans during its utterly primordial beginning. Etienne did not use the patronymic name Villeray in documentation available to us at this time, though his son used Villeray with the accent aigu or Villeray, R-A-Y, later in the middle 18th century in New Orleans. Etienne appears again in the census of 1726, this time as Le Roy, his wife, and Bel Air, his associate, again on the land of Bienville. By 1728, Etienne Roy had died, and his widow, Catherine Neveu, married her Chauvin cousin from Montréal, Jacques Hubert Belair, who, as we saw, was living with them in 1726. Jacques Hubert Belair went on to serve on the Conseil Supérieur, the Superior Council of Louisiana, and to prosper as an indigo planter. He was apparently a faithful stepfather to Joseph Villeray, and young Joseph grew close to his half-siblings, who married into the Chauvin de Lafreniere, Pellerin, and other families belonging to the colonial elite. Joseph Villeray married Louise de la Chaise, the daughter of Jacques de la Chaise and Marguerite Louise d'Ahansbourg. Her maternal grandfather was the eminent Charles Frédéric d'Ahansbourg, the longtime and thoroughly beloved commandant of the Côte des Allemands, the German coast. It was through this connection that Villeray became commander of the German coast militia and on October 27, 1768, led the fascinating insurrection of residents from the German coast and others against Spanish rule in Louisiana. The French insurgents style this happening a revolution, and its significance will be treated later by Shane Leaf. The 1767 marriage of Jean-Baptiste Augustin Payan de Noyon, Bienville's godchild and nephew, to Joseph Villeray's niece, Catherine Chauvin de Lafreniere, 
the daughter of Nicolas Chauvin de Lafreniere, who was the procureur du roi, the attorney general of Louisiana. Uh, I'm sorry. And Marguerite Hubert Belair was destined to be the last gathering of many of the most notable families belonging to the ancien population before the 1768 insurrection and the cataclysm of 1769. Spanish Governor Antonio de Ulloa, French Governor Philippe Aubry, Chauvin de Lafreniere, Villeray, Foucault, Payan de Noyon, uh, de Vince Bienvenue, Antoine Bienvenue, all related, all signed the marriage contract in December of 1767. In less than a year, many of those signatories would share responsibility for setting Ulloa's frigate adrift in the Mississippi River in 1768 and would subsequently be executed by Spanish authorities in 1769 and less than two years. The heresy of proclaiming the rights of natural law and kingdoms, as did these former French colonials, constituted anathema in the epoch of absolute monarchies of Spain and France and proved impossible to ignore. There is always a fine historic line between patriots and treasonous criminals. And of course, I don't believe our ancestors were criminals. <laughs> Jacques-Philippe Villarreal's grandchildren married into the elite descendants of the ancient population in 19th century Louisiana. One grandson, Philippe Villarreal, married a granddaughter of Bernard Marigny. Adèle Villarreal, Jacques' daughter, married Hugues de la Verne, who was to loom large in the career and gubernatorial administration of Governor Villarreal. The eldest son, Gabriel, married Eulalie de la Ronde, whose father, Pierre Denis de la Ronde, was brother-in-law of Andrés Almonester y Rojas, and he became a fabulously successful resident of Louisiana, and of course he was the maternal uncle of Micaela Almonester, the Baroness of Pontalba, who built the Pontalba buildings in New Orleans. So let's see if we can go to the next image. The next images that you will see are of Conseil Plantation. The first image is of Conseil, published in the New Orleans Daily Delta in 1855, on the 40th anniversary of the Battle of New Orleans, as part of a series about this hallowed event in our history. This house served as the principal headquarters of the British Expeditionary Force during the Battle of New Orleans campaign. This is the earliest known image of Conseil. The second image is of Conseil Plantation House in the early 20th century. In the early 20th century during the ownership of Colonel Edwin Maine. And we have a great, great grandson of Colonel Maine's here today. Note that a gable ended roof had, has replaced the hip roof in the 1855 line drawing. A two-story wing appears in this photograph, in this photograph believed to have been built by the Fletas families who were owners of Conseil following the Villarreys. The earliest known owner of the property was an Englishman, Jonathan, or Jonathan Darby, who received the plantation as a land grant in the 1720s. Later owners in the 18th century included Guy de Sonnyat de Fossin, progenitor of the Sonnyat family. Bernard Marigny sold the tract to Jacques Philippe and his son Gabriel in 1808. This stretch of riverfront from New Orleans downriver to English turn was where the colonial, if you will, who's who lived in the 1700s and early 1800s. Next now we'll look at Jacques Philippe Villeray. Jacques Philippe Villeray was born in Louisiana at Cambrulet on his family plantation in 1761. Today, Cambrulé is Kenner. After his father's death in 1769, his mother resided with young Jacques at the De La Chaise plantation, today the Faubourg Marigny. Louise De La Chaise's grandfather, Jacques De La Chaise, served as a commissioner of the Company of the Indies in Louisiana. His descendants married the most notable families of Louisiana, 
including the family of Claude Joseph Villard de Breuil, the enterprising French contractor who virtually constructed mid 18th century New Orleans. His enduring surviving structure is the old Esseline Convent on Charter Street, the oldest documented standing structure in the Mississippi Valley. His Villard de Breuil relatives saw that Jacques entered the French colonial military where he served in Saint-Domingue, which is today Haiti. He returned to Louisiana and fought as a French soldier in the Galvez expedition and married in 1784 Henriette de Fazande. He remained thereafter in Louisiana where he became a planter. In 1803, Pierre Clément de La Salle appointed Villeray to the town council of New Orleans and Villeray served subsequently in public office throughout the period leading up to the Battle of New Orleans. Villeray, as a delegate from New Orleans, helped to frame Louisiana's first constitution in 1812. He was serving as Major General, commanding Louisiana's militia when the British invaded in 1814. His earlier military training having prepared, having prepared him for the position. In 1816, Villeray, a proud native son of Louisiana, was elected governor of the state, succeeding William C. C. Claiborne, America's first Amer Louisiana's first American governor. Villeray was the first native Louisiana, uh, Louisianian to serve as governor, and he was the only St. Bernard resident to serve as governor of Louisiana. He was a, a very, very successful planter. He was well respected throughout his life for his conservative lifestyle and his effective business management. His estimated worth in 1827 was $160,000. He was a beloved patriarch of his family and universally respected for his honesty and loyalty and friendships. Many friends did Jacques Villeray generously mentor, and he was always prepared to render his very best counsel. He decided to run for the office of governor in 1830 and was viciously, unjustly maligned in awful political attacks, which undermined his health, resulting in his death. The first image is of Governor Villeray as a mature man, done about 1825. And then the St. Pauls were very kind, and Louis Delaverne before his death, to share this image of Governor Villery as a young man. It's a watercolor, and it's something that they had recently acquired. So let's go now to the final slide. You know, we were told we had to be good, be quick, and be gone. So I don't know how good I've been, but I definitely plan to be gone quickly. <laughs> this is Calice Villeray, and there are many, many descendants of Calice Villeray in this room today. Uh, he was born in 1799, and he died in 1865. He married Elisabeth du Verger and actively engaged in sugar planting. He was held prisoner by the British from December 23rd, 1814, until the British Expeditionary Force evacuated the Villery Plantation and all the area in Orleans and St. Bernard parishes which they had occupied. His eldest brother, Gabriel Villery, barely escaped capture by the British December 23rd and warned Andrew Jackson of the British landing on the Mississippi River. What happened to Gabriel Villery during during and following the Battle of New Orleans will be explored by Anthony Fernandez. Following the Battle of New Orleans, Calice Villeray established Pointe Becca Plantation at English Turn on the west bank of the river below New Orleans. Adjoining Calice Villeray's uh, plantation downriver in succession were the properties of his brothers, Jules Villeray and then finally the plantations owned jointly by Félix and Anatole Villeray. Villeray's loomed large in Louisiana's sugar industry until the Civil War. Adèle Villeray married Hugues de Lavergne, who served as his father-in-law's private secretary. 
Lavelle was an attorney, fluent in English, with a perfect speaking and writing knowledge of the language. He served as an interpreter for General Villery during the Battle of New Orleans and translated Villery's formal messages into English, which were presented to the Louisiana legislature. Governor Villery never learned to speak English. Villery also appointed Lavelle Secretary of State. Adele and Hug lived with Jacques Villeray, and tradition in the family maintains that she cared for her father during his final illnesses. In closing, descendants of the Villeray family are found throughout the United States. Ernest Calis Villeray reigned as Rex in 1968 during the sesquicentennial of New Orleans. Sidney Louis Villeray, or Sidney Louis Villeray, forgive me, Sidney, always gregarious, proud, and colorful, championed the history of the Villeray family in the 20th century and wrote the only biography of Jacques Villeray. From the beginning of New Orleans, from the beginning of Louisiana, from the beginning of the French colonization of Quebec in the 1600s, excuse me, I'm losing my voice, the Villarays and allied families have maintained a profound, prominent presence defining the French legacy in the New World. Thank you so much. <laughs>